Hi there and welcome to another At The Bar Trade Show. Uh, today we are going to be speaking to Mark, of our partners at Anderson Strathairn, uh, which is going to be part of a series looking more specifically at the key legal and challenging topics across the industry. How are you, Mark? I'm good, thank you. Nice yeah. to meet you. You too, you too. Um, obviously, as I say, we've been working with a number of, of the departments with Anderson's Hair Firm and the, the, obviously the organisation is partnered with On Trade Scotland um, to try and support the industry in a better way and give them a better kind of insight into some of the challenges that's taking place um, and how we can hopefully uh, give solutions to some of them. Um, the area that you specialise in is, is, is immigration, is that right, Mark? Or That's right. Uh, so I'm the head of immigration at Anderson Strathairn. Okay. Um, I'm based in the, it's the employment, immigrations and pension team. Okay. Um, so it's immigration, but with more a slant towards assisting businesses. Okay, um, fair enough. And I'm, I'm guessing just now, I mean, it's, there's no secret in the industry that, you know, employment and staffing has been a, quite a big issue since the pandemic. Um, one of those kind of main areas that seems to have impacted the industry quite a bit recently is how you know foreign workers coming in or seasonal workers coming in from an immigration point of view has been a big, big challenge for the industry. How, how are you as, a, as an organisation helping you know, existing clients and stuff like that deal with that challenge? Um, the, the main area is what we call work visas and okay. it is, so the UK immigration system has a work visa system and specifically it's called skilled worker uh, visa okay. and if you like um, the government's decided that in order for a business to bring someone in on a visa they must meet a certain skill level okay. um, so for the, the difficulty some sectors have is you're either on the list or you're not so if you like some jobs have made the cut to be treated as skilled and therefore can be brought in on a work visa Okay. Some are being treated as not skilled. Um, so if, if you look at hospitality generally and, and looking sort of front of house staff, you could say you're all managers, be it a restaurant manager, bar manager, hotel manager, are all considered to be skilled workers. Okay. They can be recruited on a skilled worker visa. Okay. Chefs also um, are considered to be skilled workers. Okay. Um, all other front of house staff, um, the main waiting bar staff, housekeeping, reception, security, unfortunately, they've, they've not been uh, considered as skilled, so they're not eligible okay. for is a there visa. A, is there a particular reason for that, or is there a, a is that just the government's thinking of that that's the, the best way of structuring it? That's the way the government's decided to to structure the the work visa system that they they wish uh, only that businesses can recruit employees at a certain skill level. Okay. I mean, obviously, from from an industry standpoint, a lot of the kind of seasonal staff, if you like, or um, staff that are, let's say, a higher turnover for a lot of the venues would then be considered as, as non-skilled staff. How is there ways that, you know, the industry can look at bettering, engaging from that point of view, or bringing, encouraging people to come over? Um, for the hospitality sector, um, I mean, there is a there's another regime of, of, of seasonal workers, uh, but mostly in moving into agriculture. Okay. Um, and but for hospitality, there there's no specific visa where you can bring a worker over on a temporary basis for right. seasonal demand. Um, what I would say there, though, which I'm always trying to emphasise to clients, is to remember student visa holders. Um, okay. So the number of foreign nationals in the UK, in Scotland, at universities that are on a student visa. They can work part-time or up to 20 hours during term time. Okay. They can work full-time hours outside term time Okay. in their vacations, holidays. So those holidays also match Easter, Christmas, summer. Right. So okay. they, they marry with what I would anticipate peak are some of the peak it. times. Okay. So, and Yes, I always think, say to certainly hospitality clients, uh, r remember the value of uh, student visa holders. Okay. Because um, there's the flexibility of part time work moving to full time. Um, yeah, it, got, it certainly gives them that, like you said, flexibility is probably a key um, f from that kind of angle. And I think that would probably one of the ways that 
were encouraged to come in, you know, obviously from a hospitality aspect, because there is a as kind of viewed as an industry that can be kind of flexible working hours. Uh, Absolutely, to, to yeah. a degree. Are there, are there minimum salaries that, that have to be paid to recruit staff on work visas? So, yeah. So the, the student visas they can work in any role. Okay. Um, if, if you're a student visa holder, they, they could work in any job, not subject to uh, minimum salaries. If it, if it's back to the business wants to directly recruit an employee on a work visa, mm -hmm. uh, yes, there are minimum salaries and, and quite okay. a lot of uh, up to date news. Okay, there. Could you tell us some of that? Did you, did you give us sure. some insight? I'll, I'll need that? to hit you with some numbers. But, okay, uh, no I, I can. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Prior at, at present and until the fourth of April. Um, in the system for the last couple of years has been for a skilled worker visa you either need to pay as a business minimum of 26,200 okay. per year or the going rate for the particular job and the, the, okay. the and the government have specified a going rate for each occupation so the government have decided for example for a, a chef's position or a general manager position there was a a kind of benchmark, if you like. Oh, yeah, they rely on ON Office of National Statistics data. So they'll okay. look at the data, they'll look at um, earnings for each occupation, and then they decide a going rate. So okay. if you take the chef example at the moment, the ONS says that a chef has a going rate of 17,100. Okay. okay. That's below 26,200. Okay. Chef, however, is treated as a skilled worker. Okay. So what the rules say is, the job is eligible for a skilled worker. Your going rate is below seventeen thousand one hundred, so you can bring in a chef, but you'll need to pay a minimum of twenty six two. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's really if ever you've basically got the minimum that always needs to be paid, and then you've got the going rates for every occupation. Okay. Some going rates will be way above the twenty six two. Okay. And you'll pay the going rate. Some roles will be below, and you'll pay the twenty six two. You'll pay the twenty six two. Okay. okay. Now for the news. <laughs> right, okay. okay. We'll, we'll have a bit of news. From the 4th of April, that 26.2 will jump to 38,700. Wow, that's a bit of a jump. A bit of a jump, a jump of 48%. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and the government has, has been quite straightforward. They want to reduce um, migration and reducing the number of skilled worker visas will play a part in reducing net migration. Okay. Um, so they have thus increased the the minimum salary. Okay, I mean, how does that reflect to other countries? For for example, obviously, the UK. You mentioned chefs, and we, we've yeah. spoken about kind of chefs briefly there. We speak to a lot of hotels. We speak to a lot of venues that are you know based across the Highlands and up north. That are one of the things they really challenged or struggled to find as chefs a, a, a lot absolutely so the, as i say you're talking about going rate the, the cost of a, a chef has increased quite substantially over the last since since the pandemic for a number of reasons so a lot of venues have, have said to us that you know they've tried to recruit from places like india or, or, or overseas mm -hmm. because of the talent base that's there um Obviously, that's an incentive. Increasing the salary perspective is, is an incentive for the people coming over. But is that challenging the venues to make it more challenging oh, for them to, I mean, to source I, from overseas? It, it's, it's going to be very much an open question as to whether um, hospitality for chef roles can, can meet the, the 38,700 minimum. Yeah. Um, one, just for potential uh, listeners, one thing that, that must be said, there'll be many... Um, hotels, restaurants that already have workers yep. who currently have been paying the twenty six two. Okay. They're going to they're going to receive an they there will be an increase, but much less substantial. And okay. so when it comes for if there's businesses that already have chefs or, or other skilled workers, when it comes to time for them to if they need to renew their visa, yeah, it'll be a minimum of twenty nine or the going rate. So okay. it's a so it's going from twenty six to to 29 the cliff edge is for a business that wants to bring in a worker from, for the first time, for the first time from, from the 4th of april okay that's where they're going to hit this minimum that needs to be made do you think so, that again just a, a question that's coming up a more head just now, do you think that's going to cause a conflict between people that are already in roles and in positions that have got that threshold or with for example 
you know, somewhere else, bring in a fresh individual to, to do that, knowing that that individual is going to be coming over getting a potentially a higher salary than, than they've been getting or a, a higher increase than they're getting? There's, or do you think it will turn around to be that will encourage people to move to other, other venues or look for a higher salary that are already here mm -hmm. and, and working here? I mean, for those businesses that have existing workers on one salary scale and do decide to continue to recruit but subject to the new rates, then absolutely there may be an issue of, of pay disparity, particularly okay. when, the, when the, the worker on the lower salary has been longer in the job and more experienced. More experienced. Than so a, yeah. there, 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 there's certainly um, an issue there. Um, I mean, many of my clients, it has to be said that whilst 26.2 is the minimum, many are paying more than that oh, sure. in, in any event yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for, um, for chefs. But um, it's not, again, I, I, just like you said, it's not about the industry trying to do things on the cheap and, and trying to cut corners. That, uh, like you said, a huge amount of people that we speak to are value the staff that's there and they want them to stay. So that it's not a case of only paying the minimum rate. A lot of them, that's not the case. Well, you know, that's, they're that's really right. valued. But as I say, I, I was just kind of off the top of my head seeing a, a potential, you know, banana skin in there somewhere for, for something to become an issue down the line. And yep. it's, it's some things, sometimes things that's put, put to us by venues across a number of different areas, not just from an immigration standpoint, that sometimes, you know, legislation or whatever is put in place, but sometimes it, it, it's viewed um, or understood that it, it's not the finer details of it sometimes aren't fully thought through or how they impact it, you know, things like the RS and all this kind of thing have came about, where it's not until you actually start implementing something and looking at the finer details of it, well, how does that, but sometimes can open a can of worms, is that fit? Would that be fair? I, I think you're know? right to identify that, and and it's and it, since the changes came in, that that has been one of the the points that's been highlighted. Okay. Of, um, is there is there wage disparity coming down the lines, and what issues um, may that raise? Okay. Either from a legal perspective or simply from a, a keeping staff happy perspective. Yeah. Just, just from a morale point of view, absolutely. that's the last thing you want to do is is, is you know bring people in and then you know. It, for morale to be an issue when it comes to salary or anything else, you, you want it to be a happy ship as much as you can, Absolutely. obviously, very clearly. From one of the other points I was, we've had a lot brought up to us about and discussed about, I mean, from the employee's perspective, uh, sorry, the employer's perspective, if employers still want to recruit staff on work visas, how how do they best do that? How do they best go about that kind of okay. process if it's not yeah. something they're familiar with previously? Okay. So we started at the more yeah, the end. Sorry. <laughs> we started, no, 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 not at all. We started at the end point of the skilled worker visa and there's something that needs to happen before yeah. you can get to that sure. stage. So if a business decides I wish to recruit um, staff on work visas, uh, stage one is what's called a home office sponsor license. Okay. So it's about a business making an application to the home office um, that they wish to recruit workers and they need to establish that they are a genuine um, organization, yeah. that they're acting lawfully, and um, they need to provide various financial information, HMRC, and set out a business case as to why they need to bring recruit workers. Okay. Once you have a license, that um, enables you to start sponsoring workers. So okay. with everything I've said about skilled workers, stage one, sponsor license. Okay. And, and once a business has that sponsor license, think of it as an umbrella license. It's not just a license per worker. Okay. It's you as a business have that license, and under that license, you can sponsor on the skilled worker visa as many recruits as you can justify. Okay. Does that make Yeah, make no, sense? It, yeah. definitely. I mean, for one of the, the, the key topics and one of the key things that we're keen to do is to, is to simplify a lot of situations within the industry because as I'm sure you can you understand people in the industry they've got a venue to run they've got suppliers to deal with there's an abundance of time Absolutely. that they have to look at and I could probably hear just now some people going oh, that, that that's kind of potentially in, in their in their own kind of mind's eye that's I'm going to have to jump through a whole load of hoops and um, I'm 
guessing that that's certainly something that yourself, Anderson, and any of your department could help them through and make, uh, and make a simple process for them. We, we help be it hospitality or, or across sectors um, and from SMEs to up to PLCs uh, obtain the license. Mm -hmm. um, and ob obtaining a license is you, you need to hit certain requirements, mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're not overwhelming. Um, but yeah, we assist from, from start to finish mm -hmm. um, and setting businesses up with their license and then ready to start to start recruiting. Brilliant. I think that's a a massive thing for the, the, the from a, a legal and a, a kind of financial perspective. One of the, the key things that we get fed back to a lot of the time is you know they want to do a lot of the businesses want to do things better. They want to look at how they can make the business more profitable or how they can expand the organisation and and not look at this you know doom and gloom mentality about you can't expand you can't grow. But the staffing or that, that, that a few have mentioned to us, you know, we've looked at bringing in foreign workforce before from a skill set point of view, but I don't really know where to start. Um, and it, it, once I open the can of worms, is it going to lead me down a hole that's going to absorb a lot of my time and take my eye off the business side of things, you know? Um, so it's very encouraging to hear that, that you guys would be, can take them through that kind of Absolutely. step. Uh, step. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's a big, big. Yeah, and as with any area of law or government department, there's there, there's a jargon and there's there's a specific way that something needs to be done. A document needs to be presented in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, a business case needs to be presented and cover certain bases. Mm -hmm. uh, we have experience of, of of knowing what the decision maker is looking for, okay, um, and presenting it presenting the case accordingly. So, so I think for a, a lot of people that you, you would understand that that would be the intimidating part. It's not maybe something of familiar with or comfortable with it's probably with their own comfort zone from a legal standpoint and it's like anything when you're not familiar with with an area the less you know about a situation the more time consuming in your head it can be the more daunting it can be absolutely so as i say from, from our perspective that's one of the reasons why i was keen to to have you guys involved with us to try and advise a lot of them, mm -hmm. the venues out there and a lot of the the operators out there that there are solutions to be able to simplify that problem that that's what Anderson's trying to do is to make those those challenges more simple um, and the engagement more simplified mm -hmm. would, would that be fair? Fair yeah absolutely yeah what should a business be aware of before applying for a sponsor license what what should what's their what's their tick box for one of a better one before they start the process the, the one the way I explain it to my clients when we're dealing with this is clients are approaching because they see the potential value in a sponsor license. They see that it opens up a new avenue for recruitment. Um, I need to make clear to them, you are to an extent also inviting the home office to apply oversight to your business. Okay. Okay, because a sponsor license is granted by the home office for a business to recruit workers to do a certain job at a certain location to be paid a certain amount. Okay. And the Home Office, uh, from time to time, and certainly at one point during a license, will carry out some form of inspection. Okay. Because they want to see that a business who's applied for a license, obtained a license, and then has sponsored a worker to do a job, that they've paid the worker what they said they would pay the worker. That the worker's been working where they said they, the worker would work. Yeah. Um, Equally, if the worker um, ends their employment, the Home Office wants to be told about that. So there's, there's, for, there's for a, obvious reasons. For obvi yeah. Exactly. If the Home Office, to an extent, are making the business the custodian of the, the foreign the, national okay. or the visa, therefore, and the visa is very much to do certain things, okay. and the business is responsible for monitoring that and for reporting certain things to the Home Office. Okay. Um, like, for example, if employment ends, if the worker has been absent for a certain period of time, if the role changes and it might be into a different role where a different salary applies, and that would make okay. a whole new visa application. So there's this all okay. there's these various compliance issues. When you break it all down, so I need to make clear to clients you are inviting a level of oversight. Okay. And once I've dealt with that scary bit, explained what that oversight is, and once you've laid it all out. It pretty much, if you have a functioning HR department, 
or even if you don't have an HR department, but you are on top of your HR, that will deal with the Home Office okay. compliance issues okay. insofar as the licence. Okay. Um, so I say, scare, I'm afraid I need to scare it first. <laughs> Don't go into this lightly. Understand yep. it does come with a level of oversight, yep. but let's look at what you need to do in order to be fine with that level of oversight. And when you get into that, it's kind of basic HR. Okay. That Fair would enough. be my... I, th I think that's fantastic advice. I, I think a lot of... A lot of venues and a lot of operators um, across the industry are, are looking for solutions as to how they can grow, improve, and, and really offer the customer more of an experience. Um, and as I say, from, from I've, I've seen in loads of conversations, not just uh, uh, within the industry, I'm watching JMTV the other morning, and there was a big conversation about, you know, um, People's work ethic now and how they go about things, and uh, you know that the UK's kind of work ethic as a as a statistic seems to have dropped off a cliff since since the pandemic. People are not coming in back at the offices or businesses as much as they were. So I think a lot of people are now looking overseas for people who want to work, who want to better their life, who want a career that's maybe not available to them where they are, or just to open up their opportunity base. Um, but I think. From speaking to people in the industry, I think the thing that's maybe put a block to that is the fear of the unknown. How do, how do they start that process? Is it going to be hugely time-consuming for them? 99.9% .9 of businesses in the hospitality industry, I, I have more than enough confidence that they would be able to satisfy those requirements, yeah. and I think they would welcome that. Um, I think it's the, the, the thing that's been as I say, a bit scary for them is, is once maybe out of with a lot of their comfort zones, they don't know what they take if there is any is involved. I think Brexit's changed a lot of that kind of mindset as well. Um, so hearing those kind of comments and hearing those kind of straightforward facts and understanding, I think will make a, make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as, as I say, I would genuinely encourage anyone that is looking to explore that as an option from a staffing point of view. But if they have any concerns or any questions, um, certainly get in touch with Mark uh, or any of the team at Anderson Stratherm, um, or get in touch with us and we can follow the details over with an issue. Um, and, and I think it's also a case of just having the information. Um, there's no doubt a sponsor license to recruit skilled workers. It opens up a new area of recruitment. So it's widening the potential recruitment pool. But ultimately, there'll be the compliance issues, there'll be the costs, and that's for businesses to decide. That's not something I can decide. No, sure. But what, um, what I can provide is there's the information, there's the cost, there's the level of compliance, mm -hmm. and then each business can then say, no, that is for me, yeah. or, or that's not. But without without having the information yeah. on, the, on the basics, then it, it, it's difficult to arrive without at having a decision. A clear, yeah, you're 100% yeah. right. Without having a clear understanding of what the... The potential benefits when weighing up those options to them and what they are and as i say i think from a lot of the, the people we speak to it's something that they've seen bigger organizations do and i know that the hilton group um work with a lot of overseas uh, chefs and management teams and stuff like that and it's been hugely successful for them um but i think some maybe SMEs or, or, or kind of independent venues have looked at those situations and said, I'd love to be able to do that, the clock starts great, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know where to start, I, I don't know where to begin, how do I look at that? And as I say, with most of those SMEs are, are independents, because the, the burden rests with one person. Absolutely. A lot of the time yeah. that can be viewed as time consuming or challenging, and I think that's maybe which mm -hmm. points put the block on it. Um, and one of the reasons why I was quite keen to, to have a chat with yourself, obviously, to try and Give them an insight. Yes, there's you know uh, policies and procedures and, and things that you have to yeah. go through, but th there are people like yourself that are there to be able to help them through that process. That it's not as scary. Well, that's right. From that, and, and even if it's an SME, they're, they're they're already carrying out a level of HR. Um, any business is carrying out a level of HR, and I don't think that it's adding so many more layers that it. It's going to collapse. If yeah, you like. yeah. I just, I, I think it's uh, we can give the relevant advice that they understand. Oh, this, this, this is manageable, yep. whatever our size. Um, and then, of course, tricky questions come up with compliance. Um, but 
I'm fairly confident that we can send clients on the journey, if you like, of a sponsor license, knowing here's the absolute fundamentals you need to uh, be aware of. And then, of course, they need to come back from time to time. And, yeah. and we help with that. Um, That's brilliant. We also understand there's been a, a, a significant increase in fines employers have received if found to be employing illegal workers. Is, is that the case, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in true uh, Valentine's spirit on uh, the 13th of February, okay. um, just the day before the, the government increased the fines uh, for businesses from, or well, they tripled them. So if you're oh. found to have uh, employed an illegal worker for the first time, the fine tripled on the 13th of February from 15,000 to 45,000 wow. pounds okay. per, per illegal worker. Um, if you are a business that's been found to have committed a second breach, uh, that fine's increased from 20 to 60,000 pounds. Wow. Um, so fairly massive increases. Yeah. Um, and I, I would think at a level where some businesses could be looking at the viability of their financial future if they receive one or more um, of, of well, those when you, funds. Well, when you look at what Michael Bergson, for example, was was talking about on the, the last trade show where Fiona was uh, joined us, um, he was saying that a lot of businesses, are, are, the perception is that a lot of businesses are, as much as they're busy, that that means they're, they're making huge profits and things like that, which just isn't, simply isn't mm -hmm. the case. He, he was saying that on a lot of occasions, small to medium businesses can be two to three thousand pounds from oblivion at points. Um, so having that as an impact to them can potentially shut a number of venues very, very quickly Absolutely. or put them in a really, really challenging situation. Other than the obvious point of not bringing on illegal workers, how can they, how would you? I, I mean, for example, I'm, I'm not sure how to word that. Would you be? How would you best ad advise clients to approach that situation um, from a number of, well, from a couple of standpoints? One, to avoid that being the case, mm -hmm. and and two, would that fall into the you know look at the official route if that's the right avenue for you, or what would you kind of recommend? No, what would you I suggest. But well, first issue is the home office. There's an obligation on employers to carry a right to work check for each and every employee okay. before they commence employment, irrespective of nationality. Okay. Okay, so British, Irish, uh, the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, before you employ someone, must be a right to work check. Okay. So the whole fines are, the civil penalties are received if a business has not carried out a right to work check before they employ someone. Okay. Okay, so you have the fines regime and you have the right to work checks. Okay. So the Home Office set out a number of specific checks, what are called right to work checks, okay. that a business uh, must complete. And there's different checks depending on the nationality or visa status. Okay. 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 If a business has undertaken the correct check and established a right to work for that employee, if it later transpired that they'd somehow been duped and that person did not have a right to work, okay. because they've undertaken the check in the correct way at the correct time and interpreted the results correctly, they have a defence against okay. that civil penalty. So the, the, oh. it would make them, obviously, not in a position to have to potentially pay that fine? Or, e or, or exactly. Like, okay. um, and and that's, so, so that's called the whole regime of, of, of right to work checks. So if a business is conducting right to work checks, it knows that in the event that there is ever an illegal worker found in their organization by the Home Office, they have a solid defense. Do you do you find that from a from a point of view that not just from a hospitality standpoint, but from from a, a business as a whole standpoint that that is something that's carried out religiously or is that not necessarily always I, the case. I, I would say it varies uh, vastly. Really? Um, okay. I think there'll be some listeners saying, yep, we, we, we know about the right to work checks. They can rattle off the specific terms okay. when you do which check for who, um, when you repeat it. And then there's 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 other um, sectors, businesses, where there's the presumption if it's a British or Irish uh, 
don't need to check at all. Okay. Um, if it's a, a visa holder, you only need to look at a visa card. Uh, not correct. Okay. It's, so it's the Home Office have set up a very specific set of checks. Okay. And it's if you undertake those specific checks, that's where you obtain your um, your defence against them. And I, again, I guess that's something you can help them with if they've got concerns and, and, and point them in the right direction. I mean, if an, employ, if an employer has concerns about carrying out checks correctly, what should they do? Should they do it? I mean, the Home Office helpfully does publish official guidance for employers. Okay. Okay, so it's guidance specifically directed to employers and specifying here's the specific check depending on the specific employee. Okay. Okay. Um, those checks can get a bit. The checks are easy to complete, but it's understanding which check to do and when can become right, okay. quite, quite tricky. Okay. Um, it's not rocket science. Um, <laughs> I, I'm of the view, and we provide a half day training to our clients, okay. and, and I'm satisfied that or confident after half a day, I can have an HR team or a small business aware of which check and when. Fully up to speed. Okay. And, and kind of, I, I'm not okay. going to go into all the different names of the checks. No, no, and sure. <laughs> some, some listeners will be well aware of them. Okay. Um, and, and some might not be so not aware so of much. them. Um, one major thing I find often is every visa holder normally has a, what's called it, a, it's called a BRP. We'll give you a bit of jargon. Okay. okay. It's an immigration card of their, their their picture of their date of birth and of their status on it. Okay. Okay. It looks like a driving license. Right. If you okay. like. That, albeit you can look at that and say that person has a visa, that's not good for a right to work check. It's, all right. That okay. needs to be, for any visa holder, it's all about these home office online checks. I see. So there'll okay. be some businesses out there looking at documents that look at it very official and think that'll be good enough. Uh, but it's not always the case. But it's not. Okay. Um, so it's it's really hammering home those points, taking people through the checks. There's a bit of snakes and ladders that goes on between the checks. Okay. But I'm pretty confident and have with clients half a day training we can get there. And, and then, those that half a day training is is something that we would certainly recommend them approaching you to look at if they don't already. Yeah. Um, as part of that kind of it's it's giving once a business gets hold of the, the confidence to do the checks correctly. Obviously, you know you can sleep soundly because you know that 45k fine's not coming. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but also, it means that when you're when you're looking at the student visa, or you're looking at the partner visa, when you're looking at all these visas, it's like, can we employ? It's just to have the confidence in it allows you to do it, recruit more efficiently. Yeah. If you know everything that's coming in front of you, then it, it just, I think, it, it, it's, only, it's only going to make your recruitment more effective. No, definitely. I mean, if an employee receives a fine, for example, what, what should they do? If, if they've un, been in an unfortunate situation, let's look at a kind of worst case scenario, if, if they've been in an unfortunate situation where they, they haven't done these things, maybe properly, uh, or, or understood that that's the, the, the correct way to go about it, and they do receive a fine, what, what should they do from there? Um, I, I, I do think if you've received a fine or the stage before that, it's, it's legal advice time. Okay. Um, I, I, um, I'm going to say that because it starts with an information request where the Home Office set out what they believe, how they believe you as a business okay. have infringed uh, right to work laws, okay. employed an illegal worker, and they intend to, uh, they want representations from you before they make a final decision. Okay. At that case, it could be you have established a credit right to work and you need those representations put forward in very strong terms, whilst the Home Office believe not the case, everything was done correctly. Okay. Or it could be, no, there has been uh, a shortfall here. And then it's about making representations to the Home Office. You could be uh, cooperating because of cooperation of itself can bring a reduction in the fine. Okay. And um, even if you don't get specific reductions, there's faster payment options. That okay. if you pay the full amount within a certain time, there's a thirty percent reduction. Okay. Okay. So that of a forty-five, that would be almost fifteen grand. Yeah, it's a lot of okay. money. Yeah. So um, th there's a lot of things to be looked at, um, but it's obviously very. And it, it might not just be one fund. 
Remember, it might not just be one yeah, worker. Yeah. Per worker. Yeah, per okay, so if there's been a Home Office visit to an establishment and a number of workers. Yeah, rest assured, work, they're not just looking at one, they're looking at a multitude. Yeah, it could be so pretty significant, and that's where I think it's either there's a full defence or it's time for some very serious representation. Obviously, from, from that standpoint, the we want to make sure that they are seeking advice if that is a situation that they find themselves in. It's not something that they want to bury their head in the sand about or or think is an idle set or going to go away. That That's yeah. certainly something they need to take pretty yeah. seriously then. Absolutely. They, they need to, I think it's time for legal advice because it needs to identify is there a defence? Is has a right to work check been carried out? Can we strongly uh, go back to the Home Office and say this is on a, your factor wrong? Or if it is that there's been a shortfall, we need to start putting together what case there can be, what level of cooperation, can there be a reduction? And then there, there's also, if the Home Office don't accept our position, it could be an appeal and to okay. a local sheriff court. And okay. obviously a lawyer would be uh, likely required yeah. at a local sh a sheriff court. But well, obviously at that point, as I say, we, I would certainly emphasise strongly that it, it's not something that to be ignored or think we can circumvent or, or, or learn. At, at that point, it's either a, a worst case scenario yeah. damage limitation or get your ducks in a row with someone yeah. who knows what they're doing and exactly. knows how to navigate these situations yeah. that can actually deal with it properly yeah. as opposed to... And just, to, I think, maybe just to heart back to the, the right to work yeah. aspect and the checks. I mean, some listeners might be thinking, have we to understand each and every category of visa? <laughs> that is important. We're not immigration lawyers. You, yeah. And I'd say you don't need to be immigration lawyers. You, what you do need is, and that's where I think training is to understand what are the, what are the four types of checks mm -hmm. and when do I do which? And and I think I can get clients there within half a day. Okay. And, 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 and it's really, you will have the curveball case that will, will come obviously and you will yeah. need to reach out and say yeah. i've never seen this situation before this doesn't fit in those <laughs> big broad categories that you told me about yeah okay and i'll say yeah that is a curveball and so you know from but time to time you can but, deal with it yeah it, 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 unless you see a curveball coming unless you have the conversation in the first place you'll never see the curveball the Every, everyone will look like a curveball yeah yeah <laughs> so, everything's a minefield yeah. at that point you know yeah. um, but no i think um right to work check shouldn't be um shouldn't be ignored and uh, for obvious financial reasons, but also once you actually get into it, not not too difficult. Yeah. But it looks it looks so from afar. It, exactly. That. And that's something that, that why one of the reasons why we were really keen to come in and speak to us today and, and, and obviously um kind of answer some of the kind of topics and points that we've been brought up to is because as I say, it can be a minefield, it can be a scary option. I mean, as I say, a lot of people in the industry, they're business owners, they run their businesses, they're very well versed in the hospitality industry or other business, but you're right, they're, they're not a jack of all trades. They're not a, a business owner, or a, you know, a, a chef, a restaurateur, and a legal expert into the bargain as much as some may think they are. <laughs> they're not. Yeah. So uh, we would always encourage to have the right conversation with the right people that can best put you in that, that frame of mind in that, that direction. So Thank you, Mark, today for, for, for everything. I think that's been really helpful. It certainly gave me an understanding of some points that I wasn't familiar with, and I'm, I'm sure everybody listening uh, and people watching would be would be equally as beneficial from those kind of points. So thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions, if there has, has uh, raised any topics or concerns that you have yourself, we would certainly encourage you to either drop us the information across directly, which we can forward on to, to Mark and the team, I'm sure they'd be keen to have a chat or if you're interested in the half day training or the re engagement from that perspective, um, by all means, we'd be happy to, to put you in touch. So, to Mark, thank you from Anderson Strathairn and from us for the next one. We'll see you soon. Thank you.